Welcome uh, PCS members and our friends. Uh, welcome everyone to join to our today's IBS PCS seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Marcos Rigol. And I would like to invite our scientific host, uh, Dario, to, to introduce our speaker. Please, Dario. OK, thanks, Dylan. It's really a great pleasure to have Marcos today as our seminar speaker. So let me introduce our speaker a little bit. So Marcos got his PhD in physics in Stuttgart in 2004 with a, with a thesis uh, whose title was Numerically Exact Studies of Ultra-Cold Atoms on Optical Lattices. After that, he had several postdoctoral, postdoctoral positions. I would say all of them in US, uh, for example, including University of California in Davis, including Santa Cruz, including Georgetown University in Washington. And in 2013, he joined Pennsylvania State University, where uh, he's a professor uh, right now. Now, coming to his research interest, I think it's pretty, let's say, um, fair to say that he's one of the, let's say, main actors uh, studying thermalization in isolated quantum systems. And indeed, today, his talk will be about pre-thermalization and thermalization in isolated quantum systems. So, Marcos, I leave you the, the screen and you can start. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks a lot for, for inviting me. So, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be back in Korea, even if only uh, virtually. So, uh, this, uh, this talk is uh, going to be about um, the dynamics of many body quantum systems, and in particular, in particular, about this phenomenon that is known as pre thermalization which precede uh, thermalization. So uh, this talk is mainly based on these two papers. And I encourage you to ask questions and stop me anytime so that, uh, that we can have some like good discussions. So this is uh, now the plan for the talk. So I have an introduction where I'm going to be discussing what, what we know as pre-thermalization, both uh, in theoretical studies and in experiments. And then I will discuss uh, how this, uh, this is something that, uh, that one can see as a two-step phenomenon. And that is pretty universal in quantum systems in which you have a weakly broken conservation loss. And finally, what happens when you have periodically driven systems uh, in which you can think of the drive, which is time dependent as breaking uh, energy conservation. And then we have heating rates and you will see there will be some, something that we've learned about uh, the general structure of matrix elements of observables in Hamiltonian. And then I will summarize. So uh, let me start with pre-thermalization. That was a concept that was introduced in the context of heavy ion collision, actually, in this paper. And what they were saying, I mean, at the time, they were worried about the fact that they were seeing <clears throat> this uh, after the collision, um, somehow equilibration in time scales that were more shorter than the expected thermalization times. And then in this paper, they discuss, well, what can happen is that if you have separation of time scales, you can have some equilibration to some uh, long leaf state, steady state, uh, quasi steady state before the system thermalizes. So you see, it didn't take very long for these ideas to be explored on, uh, in the context of uh, condensed matter and ultra-cold quantum gases. And in this uh, paper, they discuss what happens. I mean, as opposed to what we are used to is like turn on interactions adiabatically. What happens if you suddenly turn on interactions, for example, in the, in the Hubbard world? And these are, for example, results from other papers, from specifically from this paper, of what happens if you want with a quasi-particle weight as a function of time when you do that. So you see, uh, remember, it's the non-interacting, it's turning on interaction. It's one <clears throat> at t equals zero. And now you have here the evolution for different uh, interaction strength after you turn on interactions. And now you see what happens. So if you have a very weak interaction, so you have some dynamics, and, and you see that this becomes stationary around uh, this value. And ultimately, you expect it to go to zero at very long time, but you don't see it there. Right? And as you increase the interaction, you see again, now it's stationary or quasi-stationary at a smaller value. 
And then you see later times it deviates from that, those values. So this is what people know as pre-thermal plateau. Okay, so something that can stay there for a long time, but is not the expected thermal equilibrium result. So <clears throat> this pre-thermalization was then studied with other techniques. In this case, these were uh, numerical calculations actually in infinite dimensions. So, so people study that in one dimension, uh, for example, in the context of spinless fermions. And here they, they apply some very heavy machinery of equation of motion techniques. And in the end, uh, they look at some observables and uh, they look at what happens as a function of the interaction uh, strength uh, with the rate. And you can see there are results obtained numerically and they are very close uh, to being described by something that is proportional by u square, and that's a uh, big protagonist of uh, of this talk, uh, which is uh, in the end Fermi Golden Rule. So, and there were other other discussions about how one can understand this in the context of time dependent uh, GGs. So, <clears throat> this is an overview of early works on prethermalization on theory on the theory side. So. A lot of the interest on this comes actually from experiments. So these are uh, experimental results in ultra cold uh, quantum gases. You see obtained in the group of my colleague Dave Weiss here at Penn State. And what is shown in here is the long time result for the momentum distribution function of one dimensional uh, quantum gases uh, after they've taken far from equilibrium. So, and these, uh, these values in here, so these are for different values of gamma, which tell you how strongly interacting those, those gases are. So in one dimension, you can <clears throat> this, uh, describe these systems uh, using the lib linear model and is parameterized by this dimensional parameter. You see here is uh, the contact interaction strength and this is the density, something that can be changed in experiments. So my colleague, what he did is he had these 1D gases, took them far from equilibrium <clears throat> and waited for them to equilibrate. And after a long time, for example, when gamma was very large, you got this distribution. And that's not what you expect in thermal equilibrium, which is something that should be like a Gaussian check right here. And you see that so long as uh, he could do the experiments or in his group, so which were for values of this gamma greater than one, he never uh, obtained really that Gaussian expected result. So that's an example of, of pre-thermalization in experiments. So of course, experiments are never exactly, <clears throat> you know, integrable as, as it would be this lib linear model. And still at the longest time they could see, <clears throat> they see they didn't see thermalization. There are- uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Can I uh, just uh, briefly ask? So in the previous example of this uh, Hubbard, I think model uh, mm -hmm. simulations, uh, it seemed that uh, the uh, the pre-thermalization plateau time increased and became more dominant for weak interactions. Here it seems right. exactly the opposite. So what does that tell us? So <clears throat> okay, so that's that's a, a good uh, it's, it's an important question. So in here, what happens is that for for very strong interaction in in that other case that was a uh, uh, infinite dimensional model. So this is a one dimensional model. Okay? So the models are very different. And, and here, what is interesting is that at uh, infinite gamma in this model, you can map the system into non-interacting fermions. So it's some beauty of these one-dimensional systems. So, so essentially, this is, if you want, the most integrable case, the high gamma. Okay? So both are close to an integrable limit, so to say. You approach <laughs> integrable limit, uh, different integrable That's models. right, that's right. In the other case, the integrable limit is somehow trivial. It's non-interacting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Thank this you. case, yeah, in this case, is 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 non-trivial, but it's mappable to a non-interacting case. So it's, it's a very, <clears throat> but that, that's an excellent uh, an excellent point. So there are other experiments in a different limit. Uh, going back to that question, which is add-on chips, and in this case, these these are very weakly interacting uh, systems, and they also have seen pre-thermalization. <clears throat> so now, of course, you can ask, okay, well, but in here it didn't go to thermal equilibrium. How do you go to thermal equilibrium? So this is uh, something that we study in collaboration with a group of Ben Lev uh, at Stanford. And I see a question, uh, Dominic. Uh, yeah, could you go back to the slide? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so could you explain the uh, X and Y axis here that F and <coughs> is, uh, 
Right, right. So this is like a momentum distribution function. So this is mm -hmm. uh, how many particles have a given momentum, and they measure momentum by time of flight. So, so, so this is a picture, and that's why you see position here. But you should think of that position as velocity times time, and then velocity tells you what the momentum of the particles. So, so that's that's uh, what those plots show. <clears throat> it's just telling you how many particles have velocity zero, some velocities, and some distribution of velocity or moment. Okay. okay, thanks. Good. So that's good that you asked. You see, I mean, one gets so used to these plots and time of flight that <clears throat> because these are the same kind of plots. Okay, so again, now these are momentum distribution uh, functions as a function of time. And now, what I want to emphasize here is uh, that point I was making earlier about how different three-dimensional systems and one-dimensional systems are. So if you take a three-dimensional system, which was my, like what my colleague Ben Leth did, and, and what they do is they kick them very far from equilibrium. So you see uh, bosons at zero temperature should be all <clears throat> very close to zero momentum, but by kicking them with laser light, they create a very far from equilibrium distribution in which you have uh, the bosons, you see, with finite momentum and nothing at zero. So you do that in 3D, it's very dilute gas. See, in very short time, uh, 100 milliseconds, it goes to that Gaussian distribution I was telling you that one expects. Okay, so this is 3D. <clears throat> now, if you do the same in 1D, now you see it's very different. So at the same time, you see nothing like this Gaussian. You get this flat top distribution that I showed you <clears throat> uh, kind of before. So in here, you see this kind of distribution. <clears throat> now, what Ben led uh, had that uh, uh, that uh, you know is kind of sophisticated in the context of coal atoms. He had long uh, long range dipolar interaction that he can control. Is that this portion is uh, is a very magnetic? Uh, he can control it, controlling the angle of a magnetic field. And now, what I'm showing you here is at this point he rotates whatever uh, you see. He prepares all the state with 35 degrees. He rotates to zero degrees, 55, and 90. And now you see something that changes dramatically by doing that. So at zero degrees, you see there's almost three seconds to go to this kind of distribution, right? And if you instead have 55, you see it's half the time. And if you go 90 degrees, then it's even shorter than that. So what is shown here is by controlling the strength of that dipolar interactions, which are the ones that break integrability in these quasi 1D gases that uh, is in, in this case, he can control the time to thermalization. <clears throat> so now let me show you uh, if you quantify that with a distance to thermalization, which is the distance between what you have in the experiment and the expected like Gaussian result. So this Gaussian result is in red in here, you see in there. So you can compute that distance and plot it as a function of time. And you see here the result, for example, at 35 degrees. So some fast decay, and then a slower part. And he did that for different values of the angle. Okay, and he extracted rates. And if you get this rate as a function of the angle, you get this, this uh, set of points. And it is consistent, again, <clears throat> with being proportional to the strength of the square of this dipolar interaction. Okay, which is this uh, line with this shaded area telling us about the uncertainty in the experimental parameters. Okay, again, hinting Fermi Golden Rule. So, motivated by this, uh, with my graduate student, former graduate student Krishna, we, we look into lattice models, okay, in which we, we did uh, numerical experiments, and now you see something very similar. And this is breaking integrability in the XXC model. I'm going to get back to this. You see something fast and something slow at later times. Again, you can feed exponentials and plot them as a function. In this case, what breaks integrability is some next nearest neighbor interactions. I'm gonna be talking about it later. And, and you see that it's proportional to the square. Again, like hinting Fermi Golden Rule. So <clears throat> what uh, the, the purpose of this talk is to, to really discuss all this in a broader context not as in here that we think of it as something that is happened because you break integrability, but as something more general that happens whenever you break conservation. So at this point, I can take questions. Uh, if if the, there are remaining questions about the general uh, setup and, and what is it that, that we want to understand. Well, let me just uh, maybe ask a question, although I guess it would be better to discuss it at the end. 
uh, but I, I have it already. Uh, so uh, I uh, I was thinking about the different reasons of these uh, prethermalization uh, plateaus, and uh, I see two, but maybe there are more. So the two I see is either uh, that uh, this prethermalization is essentially uh, not a thermalization at all, meaning that uh, this is some kind of regular dynamics, and uh, you have to to wait until uh, I don't know some uh, adiabatically slowly changing uh, actions, adiabatic invariants. I'm talking more in classical terms, but mm -hmm. I guess you understand what I mean. Start to to interact, and then uh, you see some slow uh, relaxation into uh, into into uh, equilibrium. So this sounds like a bit like this uh, Fermi Pasta Ulam uh, mm -hmm. paradox uh, from long time ago. The other possibility is that you have groups of degrees of freedom which can thermalize and do thermalize, and then another group which is somehow weakly coupled. So you can, mm -hmm. which must not be by by some uh, symmetry, but can be just by chance by the way you excite them, so to say. Mm -hmm. so, but maybe there are even more. So can you uh, comment on? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, gonna. What, what I'm, you will discuss that, here, or that is exactly what we're gonna discuss. Okay, so so good. So these these are, and <clears throat> both of them you will see uh, okay. are are involved in here. But but Dominic also has a question. <laughs> yeah, a similar question to before. Could you explain these y axes here? This is the the y axis is like some distance to okay to the. I mean, in here I define what it was for the sorry, like what it was for the experiments. So you see this distance to thermalization. This is the difference between your instantaneous, you see the sum over k, the difference between the momentum distribution function that you have instantaneously, this like dark blue, and the expected thermal equilibrium result, which is this red one. Okay, it's just telling you how far you are from the, from the thermal result. And, and so this is what is shown in these uh, plots. And you see log of the distance to thermalization. So. And in here is again also the distance between the, the exact uh, result for the dynamic and the expected uh, long time result that we can mm. look at uh, theoretically. Yeah, was okay. there any reason to choosing this uh, um, basically the called two norm distance and then take logarithm? It's a, it's a strange combination. Well, I mean, I mean, the reason we do it that way because you expect to see some rate at some point, so it's some exponential, and that's why we do the, the semi-log plot. So here you have something fast, and this is an exponential, and that's where you get the rates. Okay. Oh, I see. It doesn't really matter that it's the two norm, right? Because if you take the logarithm, it just translates into different you, uh, you, slopes. That's right, exactly. You you will see it. You will see how it shows up in the theory. Are these two things probabilities as well? Because I could imagine that maybe Kubler Kleiber divergence would be um, <coughs> maybe so, more reasonable measure. Yeah, yeah, no, th these are, I mean, remember, these are, I mean, for example, these are motivated for, by experiments. Right? You experimentally, you measure something, right? It could be a kinetic energy, like a distribution. And, oh, and this I is see. all just, you are extracting one number to qu quantify the distance to be thermal equilibrium. Okay. So, mm. so th that, that's how you should think of it. I see. I think maybe the reason why I'm asking this is uh, I just wonder whether this is not some kind of residuum of d depending on uh, which function you take to yeah, measure. Yeah, it's, it's not gonna not gonna be. You you will see you will see how these things uh, <clears throat> show up later. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, good. So so now let me let me uh, step back and put it in a more general setup. Okay, so and the setup I now I'm gonna have in mind is I have some Hamiltonian that is composed from some, I'm going to call it unperturbed part and a perturbation. Now, what is important about this unperturbed part, it may be integrable or not, okay? It may be like completely non-integrable, <clears throat> but has, it needs to have at least one conserved quantity. I'm going to call it Q. So it means commute with H0, but it doesn't commute with U. So essentially this perturbation breaks that conservation law. Okay, so, so of course, if you have H0 to be integrable, then the perturbation can break infinite conservation laws. 
So now let me let me show you the model in which I'm going to be discussing the the theory and the numerical experiments. And this is the uh, the XXC model or extended XXC model written in the hardcore uh, boson uh, language. So this is a chain hardcore bosons that hop around and they interact. This part is actually integrable. That's the in the spin language the spin one half XXX chain, and this part is what breaks uh, integrability. <clears throat> okay, so this model conserves particle number. So, so it commutes with H naught, and if you want, this is the, the total SC magnetization in the spin language. So I'm gonna now choose this U to break in, uh, essentially now the conservation of particle number. It will also uh, break integrability if you only have this term to, to be of these two forms. And you will see it's important. So this term, Okay, and this term break particle number conservation, and you see this is identical between these two perturbations. But in this case, just for uh, generality, I'm going to include a part that also conserves particle number. So you see this uh, perturbation, no term here conserves particle number. So it has no overlap with that conservation law. And you will see that that would make a difference. Okay, so <clears throat> now. I will show you results of numerical experiments, and those numerical experiments are obtained in the context of these numerical link cluster expansions. It's based on a, a link cluster theorem. It has nothing to do with physics. It's, uh, it tells you that uh, extensive uh, quantities uh, <clears throat> per site in some lattice, uh, they can be written as this sum over uh, connected clusters. LC is the multiplicity of the cluster, and W is the weight of the observable in the cluster. And this is obtained by something is called the inclusion exclusion principle. The weight of the observable in a cluster is the uh, expectation value of that observable in the cluster minus the weight of the observable in all the connected subclusters. Okay? So now this all sounds uh, strange to you, uh, maybe if you haven't seen it before. I should tell you that uh, what we are very much used to in physics, these high temperature expansions, is, is nothing but uh, based on, on this link cluster theorem. So if you uh, compute this observable in the cluster using a grand canonical ensemble and, and use a high temperature expansion of that, uh, you get the usual high temperature expansion that we learn in statistical mechanics. So many years ago, I was uh, interested in frustrated magnets and low temperature. And uh, we had the idea of really going and directly evaluate these uh, exactly numerically and to obtain convergence at low temperature. So later on, I got interested in dynamics and then I extended these, these ideas to, to study infinite time average and quantum dynamics uh, after, after questions. So what is important about this link cluster theorem compared to other uh, techniques is when it converges, it gives you the thermodynamic limit result, okay? For those observables per side, the intensive part of extensive observables. So that's what's behind the numerical experiments. Now let me tell you what is behind the analytic part. So, so we want to get make analytic progress if we have a perturbation, but of course we, we cannot do perturbation theory as we learn for uh, in quantum mechanics for single particles because we have a many particle spectrum in here. Now to make uh, analytical progress, uh, what is done is uh, use this, uh, what is known as the uh, mori swansic approach and what we want to do in here is uh, if we have some conserved quantities that are weakly broken by a perturbation, we want to, to develop uh, a formalism that allows to separate what we are going to call slow variables, right? Like this concept, these quantities that were conserved, they never change if you don't break the, the conservation law. And then when you weakly break it, they are slow from other variables. So to do that, what one does is one introduces a Liouville super operator and it splits, splits it in two parts, the, the one associated with the, con the unperturbed uh, part that has the conservations and the one that breaks the conservation. So, so far, this is exact. And here is where uh, one introduces the first step to go into approximations, which is a projection okay, onto the density matrix that is characterized by the slow variables. For example, let's say the energy, and some other conserved quantity, okay? And now using this, the, the whole idea is to rewrite a P project Liouville equation and then make meaningful approximations to, to be able to, to, to make, uh, to gain some physical insights, okay? So that, that's what's behind the, the formalism. And it's been done before <clears throat> in, the, in the context of open quantum systems where these two 
to works that, that explore these ideas uh, for open systems. So now let me tell you what are the assumptions and the results from, from this formal part of, of our work. So the assumption is that first, the unperturbed Hamiltonian okay, has some time scale T star uh, that after which uh, observables equilibrate or are described by, uh, let's say, a thermal density matrix. Okay, so, so after this T star, if you don't have the perturbation, your observables equilibrate and are described by thermal ensembles of if you are an integrable in an integrable model by a generalized Gibbs ensemble that you know takes into account all conservation. Okay, so that is T star. Now, what is the requirement of G? And you see it's a weak coupling condition. So it tells us uh, we are in the regime in which this G times T star is much more than one. You see, it doesn't really matter what T star is. I mean, in general, you are going to see in the numerical experiments is order one. G times T star has to be much smaller than one. Now, what do we gain out of this? So the first thing is this pre-thermalization under the unperturbed dynamics, right? So for time, times that are much smaller than one over G, the dynamics is expected to be described by H naught, right? So you have E to the H naught uh, plus G, the perturbation. So if your T is much smaller than one over G, you only care about H naught. And that tells you that this, this G T star is much smaller than one. You expect the system to equilibrate to the unperturbed result. Okay? So now the question is, how do you get out of there? And he, the, here is where the formal development comes. Uh, the main result is a statement that for T times much greater than this T star, <clears throat> observables are well described by equilibrium state of H naught, you see it in here, the, the trace of the time dependent uh, density matrix O is described now by a result for the unperturbed Hamiltonian with a time dependent uh, conserved quantity. So if you break particle number conservation, now what you need to do is you need to change this ensemble average, taking into account that this number partic particle number is changing in time. And now, then this is what you need to compute. And this is given by a rate equation written in this way, where this D, this drift is given by Fermi golden rule. So, so that's the formal result in here. So, so and then you see this Fermi golden rule emerging from, uh, from this uh, essentially derivation assuming a slow, uh, slow operators, okay? So the corrections from this, because there will be correction, this is not exact, are then described by first order perturbation theory. Okay, so now, now the, the, the next slide is to show you that this uh, indeed is what happened and how it works. Okay, so any questions so far about, you see, I'm gonna now show you, it's very important. I'm gonna show you result from numerical experiments on one side obtained with this numerical enclosure expansion and theoretical predictions from this theory. Okay, so Dominic. Mm, yeah, I I'm looking at this, I think it's called this Fermi Golden Rule. Is it this mm -hmm. time derivative with respect to QT equals the D? I don't understand yeah, the right hand side. Is it like a differential <laughs> of a commutator? But oh, you, you, you will see what this is. Okay, I'm going to show you what it, this is, what is given by Fermi Golden Rule. Okay, this is just the, the derivative of that change in time of, the, of this conserved quantity. Okay. Is, is given by, I have to give you the expression for this. This is what is given by Fermi Golden Rule. But just, okay, just so for, for now, are this E and Q are just functions or what are no, they? E, okay, good, good, good. So E is, E naught is the energy, okay? The intensive part of the energy of, of your system. And Q, okay. I'm just saying in general, it was something that was conserved in the unperturbed dynamics and now it's changing with time. And if you want, think of it as I'm gonna break particle number conservation this is the dynamics of the particle number. Uh, okay. it's, it's some kind of like a cl classical quantity, like a mean value, right? Uh, it's not classical. I mean, you will see it has a, a quantum expression, but yeah, it has classical analog. So, but okay. le let, me, let me show you what this is and you will see, you will see how like, uh, it will connect to what you learn in quantum mechanics and so on, up to right. some changes, okay? Good. So, so now let me show you the results. Uh, okay, so. uh, Marcos, I have another question. <clears throat> Can you sure. go back please, to this? Yes. Oh, so, yeah. So uh, T star is uh, the thermalization time of the unperturbed system. So I guess this is 
uh, the time scale we need to fall onto the plateau. This That's correct. Plateau, That's right? correct. Yes. But what is then uh, the time uh, scale? Uh, how, where's the time scale coming from, which characterizes the falling off? Is that uh, is, because is, is, the thermalization itself is, is so to say is 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 well yeah yeah so what is that time scale? Yeah, yeah, that that time scale I don't know it a priori. It is given by your Hamiltonian. So if this is true, you have a non-perturbed Hamiltonian that has that time scale. I'm just telling you, if you perturb it with a G that satisfies this, this is going to be true. It, well, let me rephrase my question. Uh, so we saw this falling onto the plateau. That times that is controlled by T star. That and is T star. It, it, it's it, and then we go down. Yes. And that going down, that time scale, when that happens, uh, uh, how is that related to the parameters which you introduced? Okay, you will true? see. You will see. So this is an excellent question. It turns out that there is no such thing as a true plateau. So what we like, what you saw as a plateau is nothing but an exponential, but an exponential decay with a small rate. Okay, you're going to see it. Uh, you're going to see me. Okay, so but that that's it. But the T star indeed, I mean, it's something that we not we cannot control. I mean, it's just given to you by your own perturbed dynamics. Thank good. You. So good. So okay. let, let's. So let me start is the is the time at which let's say this fake plateau start to. That's right. Start to appear. That's right. This okay. is if you don't have the 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 perturbation, that that is the time that it takes for your own perturbed dynamic to get really very close to to the thermal equilibrium result. Okay. okay, and you say you somehow. Try, then you have let's say the the plateau, which is not a plateau, but okay, it's close. And then you have again a fall off, which is much faster than than the this. Plateau. This is an excellent question, Dario. I mean, that's an excellent point that you saw that. Actually, at this point, we all believe that it, that was an artifact of the numerical calculations of that original original paper. There is no third regime. So, so I see. So, so that, that was, I mean, I think it's an excellent that you, you see that point. You won't see that third regime in anything else that I'm going to be showing. I thought, I see, I thought uh, that was the regime at which uh, this first order perturbation theory breaks down, but you say no. That it doesn't exist. That regime was uh, uncontrolled okay. numerical results, <laughs> I, I believe. Okay, so. I see. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me then show you the result. That's great. I see you mm -hmm. guys are totally following this and, and you know, continue asking questions we stop at any time that that we get to so good so let me then just tell you that the way we're going to do this we have some initial temperature some initial chemical potential some initial parameters of the hamiltonian and then i just want to make sure that that you see i'm not at all in a, a linear response regime so i'm going to suddenly quench these parameters far from the original value so you see i double the t and then one like a, like a, a two-third of the original v so take it very far from equilibrium, and then I turn on my perturbation. Okay, it's not like I have a system in equilibrium and I turn on the perturbation. No, no, I take a system in equilibrium, take it very far from equilibrium, and at the same time, turn on the perturbation. So this is what happens now, for example, with the, the filling. Remember, it's the number of particles divided by the number of large sites. It's the intensive part for different strength of that perturbation. Okay, so you see very small uh, perturbation it changes very slowly, okay? So, and you see, as you increase the perturbation, it changes more like rapidly, and they all will go to this one half that comes from, because there is a particle hole in the, in the Hamiltonian, and you will go there, okay? Not important, we know the final result. Now, this is not illuminating. Let me show you what happens if I compute the, subtra I subtract from this time evolution the, the long time result. And now you see these beautiful exponentials. Okay, that, uh, that uh, Dominic was asking, why do you plot a semi-log? These exponentials are telling you that, that you now have a rate, okay? So there is another detail here about the link cluster expansion that I'm gonna skip. I have to look at different orders and see where they match. I'm gonna skip that. So believe me that uh, this is all, I mean, well thought about having the control numerics. So where, where the, the different orders match, I feed an exponential, you see these are these uh, like uh, black lines, and I get a rate, okay? So this is what is plotted in here. These rates from the exponentials as a function of G1. So you see I'm changing G, and you see 
and, and then I do this for different orders of the link cluster expansion, and you see that they match for different orders. You tell me that this is control, okay? Except at the largest G, you see some deviations. Then we need to take this this result with a grain of salt. But in here, they are they are well controlled. Okay. So the first thing is that we have a rate. This and this is, is always rate. let's say for let's say uh, about what we discussed before is always later than T star. So T star is is something that we don't see here because it is a very early time. This is an excellent question. We don't see that it's starting here because this is the conserved quantity. That that would not change if I don't break the the integrability. I don't break the conservation. Ah, sorry. Okay. Ah, ah, wait, this wait, is wait, this wait, is wait. the this is the low variable. That's excellent. This is particle number. You will see that it's starting the next in the next slide when I look I at other. Okay. Forms. Okay. That but that that's a very good question. So this is the conserved quantity which would not change if I don't put the perturbation because it's conserved. Okay, so because here this... I didn't put yet the perturbation. I thought yes, because no, no, no the perturbation it's... is here. No, no, the perturbation is here. So, Dario, what I'm saying is that you cannot see the T star because this is a quantity that doesn't change in the unperturbed dynamics. Okay, okay, does it does I it, see. It's like a, in the Hamiltonian that I had, particle was conserved, the unperturbed dynamic conserved particle number. If I plot it, it's unchanged. Okay, you don't see the T star here. I'm going to show you next. But mm -hmm. now coming back to those questions as to what is this drift, right? This is the, the equation for the drift, which is your Fermi golden rule. Look, you, you've seen this in Fermi golden rule and you've seen this in Fermi golden rule. So what is different from the usual Fermi golden rule? Then now you have particle number because you see this is a rate for that conserved quantity. So that gives you the actual units. And you don't have this part, which is some uh, weight uh, the projection of your density matrix you see in here in the unperturbed basis. Okay, so so this is uh, without these two parts, this is the per the Fermi Golden rule you are used to. And there is the G square. Okay, so that's what this drift was about. And now to compute the rate, uh, you just get this n n dot divided by the distance, and that gives you a rate. So if you want, to just take an exponential, and you will see that that's what gives you the rate. Okay, Dominic, you have a question. Yeah, so I see what is the change in uh, N of T, but what is the N of T? How do you define that? I suppose it's like number of particles somewhere or? Yeah, that's the N of T is the filling. It's the total number of particles divided by the number of Lattice sites as a function of time. Oh, but isn't that conserved? Not if you break, I mean, remember, this is G, this is the perturbation. Oh, okay. I see, so this is... Uh how many particles well yeah, this is the, the rate the at which the particle, particle number increases that's basically. right that's right or because and you or and your l is fixed the, the length of the lattice is fixed that's the important thing is the thermodynamic limit that's why we we plot the intensive part so what we get out of this link cluster expansion is the number of particles divided by l the filling in each side okay so how many particles you get in each side uh, okay uh, I, I think I get that, but uh, when you do the simulations, do you fix L? That if somebody Remember, large again, number? again, it's a link cluster expansion. There is no L. It's how many clusters I can include. Okay, it's not an exact uh, system size. It's, it's a link cluster. So it, it is that technique that I, I mentioned before. But we can discuss if you want that at okay. the end of what is the detail. So what I'm telling you is when these converge, right, when the, the things... Uh, are not changing with changing order is the thermodynamic limit result. Okay, ah, but, I see. But now let me surprise you, right? This is the, the analytic expression. Now let me evaluate this. And now you see some top of the experimental, if you want, numerical experimental result for the rates, which tells you that indeed, uh, this rate is described by this Fermi Golden Rule. Okay? Good, that's excellent. Now let, let's come back to Dario's question. What happens if I look at another observable at the nearest neighbor correlation? This guy changes even if your perturbation is zero because I've done a quench. And this is your T node, Dario, you see? Very quickly, you go to that grand canonical ensemble. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let me show you what happens if I perturb this. So this is the unperturbed dynamic, okay? G1, zero, this is unperturbed dynamic, G, G2, zero. So if I, turn on the perturbation, now this is the dynamic. So you see, 
for some time, the dynamics is like the unperturbed one, right? And then suddenly at some time, mm -hmm. the system realized, wait, you have a perturbation. I'm not going to this equilibrium state. I'm going somewhere else, right? And you see similar for this G2, okay? So now let me show you the result of this projection, right? The, the, the prediction of the unperturbed ensemble. And now you see the difference between these two perturbations. So you see in this case, you go to something that is slightly different from the exact. In here, you don't see the difference. But what is important is the rates, actually, that you get in here. You see, this is parallel to this. The rates are the same. So the rates are the same, but the state is slightly different. And this is what we can predict now using first order perturbation theory. OK? So we can study this difference as a function of g. And now you see, as a function of g1, you see that it's linear. And we can even get the next correction, the g square. And if you look at it as a function of g2, it's quadratic, so there is no linear term. And we can even get the next correction with g cubed. So how do we understand this? It's precisely looking at this first order correction, OK, given perturbation theory. The point is that k is uh, the kinetic energy uh, is particle number conserving, rho naught is also, this is the, the one for the unperturbed dynamics. So if you have an operator, a part of your perturbation that conserves particle number, this is not, this is going to be in general non-zero. But if you don't have it, so if your perturbation doesn't have any overlap with this conserved quantity, this is zero. And you see that the, the linear correction vanishes. So that's what's happening here. Okay. So what, what, what you, you see from here is that we can get the rates and we can also get uh, the, the actual expectation values of observables up to these corrections. Okay, so, and then if you don't have the linear term, then you are in pretty good shape because you don't even need to correct for it, right? So you get essentially the G square result is uh, the correction is very small and then you just use the unperturbed uh, dynamics. Okay. So this is, uh, this is all I wanted to tell you about this generic Hamiltonian. I just want you to, to see results what happens if I focus on the integrable limit. You see, when I take this T prime, B prime zero, and I do the same, it works, OK? So all I wanted to say is that you get rates. And if you apply the calculation, sorry, Fermi golden rule, it matches pretty well, OK? So the, this, this applies both to integrable and non-integrable models. So questions about this. So I, I can take uh, questions before I go to the um, periodically driven system. So any question about this this part? So Alexei, I think you, you were the first. Yeah, well, a very simple question. So then um, wouldn't it then make sense in the case where your part of your perturbation preserves whatever conserved quantities you have mm -hmm. to actually not consider as a perturb this part as a perturbation, but rather include it in the uh, unperturbed you, Hamilton. Because so far my understanding was that your H naught, I mean, the advantage or the convenience was that it was also integrable. But uh, I guess at the numerical level, that's maybe not very important. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you could just put it inside it. But, but you know, in experiments, you have your, uh, your unperturbed part and you are given uh, your, your perturbation. Okay. So, so it, is, it is in there and you just have to know how to use it. You, you notice something interesting indeed is that the one that we chose was even part of the Hamiltonian for simplicity, but it could be something more complicated, right? So in principle, mm -hmm. this could break integrability, for example, and so on. So for the integrable case. But you are totally right. I mean, you, just, you could just throw it inside, in, inside the other part. All right. Well, I have one more question. Sorry, that just came to my mind. What about the case where um, you basically, if in, I guess that's the case where you have several uh, conservation laws and you only break uh, no, actually, no, no, sorry, that doesn't make sense. I was thinking what happens if you couple several uh, conservation laws, but then I guess you just get new ones. So uh, things you could, but, 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 yeah, but in this case, uh, for example, in the integrable model, I have infinite conservation laws and I am breaking them all. And what I'm looking is just the dynamics of one of them, like conserved particle number. Okay, this is what mm -hmm. I'm showing you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and, and Dominic, you have you have another question. Uh, yeah, uh, totally. Uh, yeah, I want to get back to the bigger picture. So, like you started with saying isolated systems, but now mm -hmm. now I wonder which kind of systems do you study. So you study a system that's uh, basically this one D hardcore bosons, mm -hmm. but then you add this perturbation, which changes the number of particles. That's so right. by isolate. You, by isolated, you mean unitary dynamics, I suppose, but not necessarily that there are no particles coming in. Right. I mean, so with, with particle number, it's a bit more complicated to think about this, but think about spins, right? You have spins, and then this particle number is the magnetization in Z, right? It's something okay. that you can break and, and so on. It's still an isolated seat. I see. Okay. okay. So I agree that, that and, with and how, particle how much number... Depend yeah. How much depend on your analysis is uh, on this particle number or you know, number of spins? Could you do exactly the same with some different? Uh, of course, quantity? of course. No, the, the theory is completely general, right? I was just telling you the theory is that you break whatever. I mean, I just chose particle number or C magnetization because it's uh, something that we, we are used to think about, but it, 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 mm -hmm. it was never inside the theory. It's inside the, the actual numerical experiment, but but the theory is general. Yeah. And uh, you also assume that uh, you have one conserved quantity which is different from Hamiltonian, right? Because Hamilton is always conserved quantity. Like the energy, that's right. Right, okay. Yeah, in here, so that's right, you're right. I mean, I had the energy and then particle number, I broke particle number. So that, that connects very nicely with this last part because what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna break the energy by driving it. Uh, it's isolated, but I'm going to drive it. So still so unitary dynamics, but also energy changes. That's right. The other okay. one was unitary dynamics in which the Hamiltonian doesn't change. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good question, right? OK, thanks. Sorry, can I, 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 I'm sorry for asking. Can you, can you tell me again why I don't see T star in that plot? I'm, I'm sorry, because. So you uh, see T star if the, the quantity that you look at is not conserved uh, in the unperturbed dynamics. And this is this open. Ah, correct, unit, correct, right? correct, so, correct, so, correct, correct, correct. Right, right. So if, if instead okay. of showing you this sure. quantity, I show you particle number, it's unchanged because it's conserved. Okay, you, you don't know sure, that sure, you, sure, you sure. take, yeah, good. You took the system out. Absolutely. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no dynamics for the unperturbed exactly. case. Of purple. Okay. Right, Got right. it. Sorry. Good. So now I'm going to do the same, uh, but uh, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, can I, uh, maybe it's something that we may discuss later, but this link, uh, link approximate, I don't remember link how you closer. call it. This uh -huh. Okay. Is it something that you can apply whatever system, are, I mean, at the technical level, is, is it a, is a yeah, I mean, it's very general. That... Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, for so why models is very general? I mean, yeah. But so why, for example, people working in many body localization uh, cannot, and they argue if let's say what they right. see is a finite an effect and so on. So why they don't use it? Is so there... first is 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 uh, in the, the straightforward the most uh, the simplest implementation is for translational invariant systems, right? So, uh, but but you can do disorder and so on. It gets more complicated. But but this is a technique, right? That you do the calculations. I mean, you have to do the expansion and either converge or not. I mean, you can work harder and get more. But but uh, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't converge, then it's not useful for your problem. Okay, so that that's the drawback, right? It's like like quantum Monte Carlo and the same problem, right? So if you don't have the same problem, you use it's perfect. Uh, you have the same problem, you are in trouble. Okay, so here is if it doesn't converge, it doesn't converge. That's it. And so for your, your problem has some correlation length and it doesn't capture it. You are done. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah good. it's very generic. So good. So let me try to tell you in five minutes uh, this uh, very quickly what happens if you periodically drive the system. Um, you you can... can take 10 minutes. Uh, oh, okay. Or... Perfect. Perfect. So yeah. we have like a lot of discussion. So it's good. So so good. So I have the, number, I have the time independent part and I am going to drive it with some, uh, some uh, uh, local operator. 
and it's periodic, okay? So, and if it's not sinusoidal, you can always fully decompose the drive. And I'm, I'm gonna use a square drive because it's simpler for numerical calculations. So now my unperturbed Hamiltonian is more complicated because I want to break even particle number conservation, not to have anything conserved except energy, and then the drive breaks energy conservation, okay? So again, I mean, I wanna be away from the linear response. So I'm gonna start with some temperature, okay? Some initial temperature and some parameters of the Hamiltonian. And I am gonna quench the Hamiltonian, take it far from equilibrium and turn on my drive, okay? And now I'm gonna focus only on the energy, okay? So this is the slow variable. I'm not gonna show you any other results uh, just to make it simple. So you see, if I now look at the energy as a function of time, uh, you see the exponential results. And this is because at infinite time, it should go to infinite temperature, which is zero energy, okay? Now I don't have to subtract anything. So this is good. It's just telling you that you have rates. You can extract the rates uh, from fitting exponential, you get this. And now you can use Fermi golden rule, okay? So you see it's a bit more complicated because we had the expansion, the Fourier expansion and so on. But, uh, you know, you go through this, it perfectly describes the results. Okay, so it's just telling you, you know, this theory uh, totally makes sense uh, also for, for energy conservation. So now in here, we want to take a step forward and, and then look at this expression and try to make analytic progress already on this. So. Uh, let me just write the expression again. It's this in here, we just used to the delta function, energy differences, uh, this projection and this matrix element. So the matrix elements, uh, we can make progress just using uh, eigenstate thermalization ANSAT. And what it tells you is that the off diagonal, so you see these are off diagonals, you can write it as one over the square root of the density state. This is something exponentially small, some smooth function and some random number. Okay, so these are the definitions of, uh, of uh, E and, and omega. So E is the average energy between the two states and omega is the difference. And D is the density state. So that's good. So we have an answer for this from ETH, from this eigenstate thermalization. And if eigenstate thermalization is valid, what we have learned is that the details of the state are not important. So what we can do is replace this projection of the density matrix into the unperturbed basin, which is some, something really complicated by the thermal distribution, okay? Because the, the essentially the details are not important. Now we can plug these two guys in here, change the sum by integral, put the proper measure, density of state and so on. And at high temperatures, this expression simplifies into this expression, okay? So what is it that you have here? Some normalization, trace of H naught square, but what is important is that now uh, these rates are functions of this smooth function and of the density states, okay? So now does this work? So let me just show you that it works. So these again are results of numerical experiment for different Gs divided by G squared. So that you see that these rates do not depend when properly normalized on G. You see they collapse. And if I do the, I evaluate this expression, okay, in here, there you go. Uh, we evaluated for different uh, cluster size using exact analysis. You see it matches the results. So one important thing here, going to the bigger picture, is that heating is something that people have been worrying a lot about in this driven system. And what you find is that for high frequency, heating is exponentially suppressed. So this part in here is exponentially uh, small in, in omega. Okay, that's that's good news. I mean, here you can get a lot, but heating, but here is exponentially small. Now, since this is exponentially small, you realize immediately higher harmonics are not important. So, if you instead of summing over all, you just sum over the first one, the m equal one, you see the results are almost the same, except at low frequencies. Now, why I care about this? Because that means that I can just go back to the expression and put m equal one, and in the limit, in the thermodynamic limit because energy is extensive and omega is intensive, you can do an expansion around um, essentially zero frequency. Uh, and you get that the rates you see now are really directly proportional to this F function up to normalization constants, okay? So, so, and that's great because now you can reverse. So if you know the F function, you can predict the rates, but you can now use experiments measuring heating rates to predict and to explore this F function. 
Okay, so Dominic, let me let me just close on this, and then we can go on discussions. So that uh, that uh, uh, yeah, let me just close that idea. So the same, you can use the same uh, approach in integrable models. So these are results for an integrable model, and again, everything works fine. So this was surprising, actually, that we close our eyes because eigenstate thermalization is supposed to work only for non-integrable models. So this was like, how can it be that we have integrable models and the expression works? And the reason is actually something that we explore in more detail later, is that the variance of these of diagonal matrix elements is perfectly well-defined both in integrable and non-integrable models, so long as the integrable models are interactive, okay? And this is important. And this, this is shown in here, quantum chaotic models, this variance for different system size and properly normalized, and you see for the result for different system size match, and you get that exponential. And if you do the integrable model, again, you see they perfectly match for different system sizes. So in the thermodynamic limit, it's going to be perfectly well-defined. And we even gain another thing in integrable model is that since the, uh, the rate is faster, we, we can observe what happens at higher frequencies uh, before we run out of a spectrum in our finite system. And we can even see that there is a part that is Gaussian that people had not discussed before. So that, that, was, that was amazing for us that you could, you could still define these variances for, uh, for integrable models. But then the question is, is this part of ETH the same for integrable and non-integrable? And the answer is no. Because if you look at the distribution of, of diagonal matrix elements of non-integrable models, is in the quantum chaotic model, non-integrable is perfectly Gaussian. Okay, that's something that people have used when computing uh, response function of products of operator. And you have Gaussians, you you can do you know, you know higher order integrals, but in the integrable model, it's nothing like a Gaussian. It's actually closer to a log normal distribution. So you can see that if instead yeah, this, uh, this thing is universal for integrable model or is model dependent? I, I think it, it's universal. This uh, skew log normal like. So you see if I plot the log, you see that it's mm -hmm. not quite log normal. It's a bit skew. Uh, and, and this is something that we are actually looking at uh, right now that we've made, we've made some progress. Okay, so it's not quite log normal, but it's close to skew uh, log normal distance. So this is it. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So let me just summarize. Um, what I have shown you here is an isolated quantum system, integral or not, with weakly broken conservation laws. Um, you know, equilibration occurs in two steps. So you have this uh, pre-thermalization, which is the, the unperturbed dynamics. And then the slow part is really an exponential uh, with a rate that is given by this uh, Fermi golden rule, okay? The slow part is described by an autonomous uh, equation where the drifts are given by Fermi golden rule. Uh, the other thing is that uh, with that, you can also predict expectation values of observable at different times, but there is a correction, which is in general described by first order perturbation theory. Unless you saw there is no overlap with the conserved quantity and then, and then that first order correction vanishes. And the final thing that I show you is periodically driven systems. They can be used, right, to probe that F function because the rates are proportional to the, that smooth function of the ETH. And for integrable models, just the bias. So with that, <clears throat> let me thank my collaborators, especially in Tyler LeBlanc and Krishna Malaya. They were graduate students in my group, now moved to, to different positions, the support of NSF. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for an uh, excellent talk. Uh, let us thank our speaker. Okay. And uh, I believe we can give now a question to Dominic, if he still wants to. Yes, on the, on the slide 36, I think. Mm -hmm. Here or here? Oh, yeah, this one, actually. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned for large omega, and actually, do you remind what is omega here? Um, omega is a frequency of the drive. Oh, I see. So, okay, so, remember, yeah. so you mentioned with the increased frequency of the drive, people would be worried about overheating, but 
then you say ex exponential is small. Right, right. So in general, okay, so this, this is an important, so, you know, people think about driving systems to, you know, access some uh, different states that you cannot have in equilibrium. The problem is that you heat up the system. So, so the, the, the point of this, uh, this result is if you drive at high frequency, the heating rates, you see, they decay exponentially. So what does this tell you? That if you are driving at this frequency 10, your heating rate is ridiculously small. So you will not heat the system for a very long time. Okay. Okay. So but isn't is this, I'm, I, mean, I mean, looking at this gap, isn't this uh, just a theoretical result uh, which comes from the fitting with your theory? Because I think the data points are not exploring that region, right? It just right, right. slightly okay. deviated. Okay. Okay. So, so let, let, let's, 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 let's go through it. Indeed, these points in here, right? Are the ones that I get, I do the numerical experiment. I see some heating rate and I feed it. Right. But of course, when this heating rate become very small, I, I just cannot do the feeding. <laughs> okay. So, so essentially for the times that I can run the simulation, there is no change in the, in the energy. So that's why I run out, oh, I I, I run out of, of the experiment, right? But then you see there are these two lines and these two lines is the evaluation of this expression. Yeah. Which is theory again, but now it's not a heating rate. Is is this? Uh, it's not a heating rate obtained from from a fit. It's obtained from from that equation, right? So I believe this is correct. So I believe this line, which matches the experiment where I can do the experiment, will match the experiment where I cannot do it. So I believe these rates are correct, and just that uh, I am not able to see them. So that's interesting. It says that if you drive it really fast with very high frequency, it just doesn't heat. That's correct. And I should tell you that early on on this story of the you know heating and many body systems, people proved theorems, right? I mean, there were bounds actually, uh, maybe not that tight, but uh, in which they 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 prove that uh, you cannot go faster than some exponential. Okay. It's, it's very counterintuitive. It's exactly the opposite I would think of. Oh. No, but why? Why? Think about this. These are local operators, right? So mm. so you, you want to put a lot of energy in the system, but the spectrum the, the in a site, right? I mean, if you want to, you, you want to think like uh, you have a finite band, bandwidth. So, so you need to uh. couple many sites. So you want to think about in perturbation theory and you need very high order to be able to get rid of that. And that's why your rate is extremely small. Okay, it's, it's intuitive. Oh, I see, because... It's, it's oh. really intuitive, actually. Yeah. So it, it, is it, it, because... is all, it is all because of your, uh, you know, you have a local Hilbert space that is finite. Of course, if you would have bosons, we have your Hilbert space could be infinite there, then the, the story is different. But here, in each side, you can have only two states, occupy or empty, mm. or if you want, minus one half, one half in the spin language. So where do you put the large energy? You have to, to distribute it over a large piece of your system. You see, and it just doesn't take it in. Because it's just exactly, exactly. It's, it's very interesting. It's like, like you see, it's like you take, I mean, in, in this counterintuitive thing about finite bandwidth, you take two bosons with very, very strong repulsion and put them together mm -hmm. in a side. It's bound. Why is that? Because the free bosons, they just have this bandwidth, I mean, like, uh, let's say 40, 40, 80. That's all the energy they can take. If your interaction energy is 100 T, they will never come apart even though they are repulsive. You don't have where to put the energy. Hmm, I see. Can I think of it as well as uh, like the one over the frequency is the energy difference and that's just very small. Well, actually, I don't know how to. I no, just no, wonder about the matching somewhere. between different energy, like the energy difference between different energy eigenstates. Um, Two energy again states that are very close. Right? The, 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 remember this omega, right? This omega mm. is the energy difference in be between the eigenstates. That's right. Right. Okay. So so and now the tricky part is that you have to see that energies are extensive. 
omegas are intensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, because these are many body systems. Okay. Okay. So so and the point is that to connect two energy eigen states, right, that have a large omega, even though in energy terms is very small, uh, you just cannot do it simply with these local operators. Okay, it's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is something that people discuss early on, and they, uh, like uh, that, that uh, somehow saving saving the day for for heating. Right. So, but Sergey has has a question. Yeah. Uh, um, thanks for the very nice talk, uh, Marcus. Uh, I, I come back to my question at the very beginning. So. Yeah. Now, uh, it's clear to me that the, you will look at a system which has, say, one conserved quantity, and then you break this. Mm -hmm. And then you look at, and this is how you study pre-thermalization, uh, or this is a, the setup. Now, what if we go to an integrable system? Uh, is there any uh, qualitative change in uh, what we learned today? Right. So, so this is the integrable system result. Okay, so what is important? So what is important is that in this integrable system, I break infinite conservation laws, but I only studied in here the evolution of the particle number. Okay. Okay, so, so indeed, so it, it becomes very complicated, Sergey, I, 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 and this is something that is yet to be studied of what happens now with the observables like you see i didn't show you in, in here i show you this observable right the kinetic energy mm -hmm. right how do you describe now observables in this integrable model because not only have you broken particle number you've broken a lot of other guys and then it will depend on on which one somehow is the slowest that has a high overlap with your observable Okay, the rate is going to be uh, given by, by those guys. And then indeed, uh, it, it's going to depend a lot on the observable. So this is an excellent question that, uh, that you know, it will depend on your observable, definitely. Right. Uh, on the other side, if we go, uh, if you allow me to go classical for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the notion of, um, of thermalization can be uh, more or less uh, well defined well, can be more or less pinned down by some dynamics on a phase space uh, manifold, uh, and and and, talk, and and then we can talk about uh, mixing and uh, uh, and ergodicity and, and and such things, which are more or less well defined things. Uh, it, it kind of, I would say, at least there becomes. I still I can look at a, a classical system which has a, a conservation, a conserved quantity, and then I break that. That's uh, and ask again, what will happen? Is there any pre-thermalization? Probably yes. And yes. how will that, uh, uh, what are the properties of that? And at the same time, I can also uh, ask the question of going to the integrable limit. Uh, and of course the issue then becomes again, what what are the observables? But, but these are technical issues, which I think it seems to me, uh, well, are technical. So are not so much of a, I'm not sure how, how how easy they are, or how complicated or more complicated it becomes when, uh, when we go quantum. So, so what mm -hmm. about this connection to classical uh, uh, thermalization or pre-thermalization studies? Is there anything which uh, you would quote, which is somehow related? I mean, I think that it should happen there. So, so I think, uh, you know, in the classical literature, a lot, a lot has been proven and, and so on, but, uh, I mean, mostly in the context of finite system, right? You have KAM and, and so on, right? So, so and then, of course, you know, you get the different school fighting about what happens in the thermodynamic limit. I mean, so does it survive, does it not? And so somehow the picture that emerges from here is that, I mean, I mean, there is no KM. I mean, it's, it's not a stable. It translates into a time scale, right? That that comes with the with the fact that uh, if you are very close to the integrable point in the thermodynamic limit, you can still break integrability, uh, but uh, it will take very long for you to get to the thermal equilibrium, uh, the thermal equilibrium state. 
right? But then, of course, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. It, it, it will depend on the, I mean, observable. It will depend on on the actual state of your system, uh, on on what is it that you've changed, how you took it out of equilibrium. So, so yeah, it is it is complicated. And and you see, Sergey, in in this uh, uh, in this equation, right? It is all encoded in first the observable. Uh, I mean, how you break uh, the the integrability is here, right? Uh, the observable is in here, and the initial state is in here, <laughs> right? This is the projection of the time evolving state into the unperturbed. So it is all in there, and in general, it's going to be uh, uh, very complicated. So if you are you have a quantum chaotic system and you have this eigenstate thermalization, then you have a handle on this. Uh, once, once you are integrable, the structure of this guy is peculiar, right? Um, and then, then yeah, it, it's complicated. <laughs> I okay. think that's the, that's the bottom line. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, okay, let me ask, uh, maybe coming to the last uh, driven part, uh, are there any experiments being done? Uh... Right. There, are there experiments in the driven, uh, in the driven system? Actually, um, there are a lot of experiments on driven systems um, focusing in somehow the weakly interacting, non-interacting regime, right? Like. Uh, there are, uh, for example, in coal atoms, there are experiments that they've been looking at topological states, right? But they've been uh, around like non-interacting points. Then there are all these and many, many experiments on um, photonic, right? Topological photonics, again, no interactions uh, uh, there, right? They have the light and so on. And, and then there are experiments with materials in which uh, uh, yeah, the role of interactions is, is, is a tricky one. So, so yeah, I mean, I have talked to experimentalists like Manuel Bloch and, uh, you know, trying to motivate and looking into this with the, with the experiment. But, but so far, um, this hasn't been, like, looked at experimentally. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the, the other one, yes, right? I mean, the experiment I showed at the beginning is is really showing that pre-thermalization, right? Like this uh, the momentum distribution. That's right. right that's right. Mm -hmm. This this experiment, like this one, right? So th this is experimental data, right? So right. Mm -hmm. But in in so so in the driven uh, this kind of uh -huh, it it doesn't make sense uh, maybe for the distributions right so so what would be the observable to to look at right you could look at like we did in here the energy of the unperturbed model right I mean you could still look at energies so I mean here heating right so let me just show it here so oops so what we look is at the uh, look at it in here is the H naught. So what is uh, the expectation value of that H naught as you evolve uh, the system, right? So so if H naught, if you have no drive, H naught it conserve, right? So so and mm -hmm. that that's how I mean they could look at that. Right? They actually can can look at that because they can you know evolve the system. And then uh, somehow like like uh, project back and and see how much they have uh, they have heated. So so you, you see, I mean, the way that sometimes they, they do that is beautiful, right? So so for example, they can load it in an optical lattice. Right? They have a BEC, right? They load it in an optical lattice. They do some dynamics and remove the optical lattice, and they get back another condensate. So is it at the same temperature or not? That's how early on on, on experiment with more insulators, they said there was almost no heating. Right? They said the thing was coherent. So they loaded, they did the more insulator, came back, the same BC. So they could do the same, right? They loaded, drive it, go back and see what is the change in temperature. And so, so they could see how much energy they put in there. Mm -hmm. I see Sergey has another question. Yeah, uh, um, 
There are cases where, like in, for instance, in the Bosa Hubbard uh, model on a lattice, mm -hmm. um, where this uh, second uh, integral of motion, uh, that is the total number of particles, is sufficient to, to drive the system into uh, rather strange, probably uh, non-thermal uh, states. Um, things depend now on, on the filling uh, factor and, and, and the energy density to which uh, the system is excited. Um, so are you aware of, of how such... Uh, uh, so basically, I'm, I'm not now to, uh, destroying the adding a perturbation which is which is um, uh, destroying the second integral of motion. Instead, I'm just uh, tuning uh, some densities. So say I have two integrals of motion. So say I have two densities, uh, particle and energy, uh, mm -hmm. which I can uh, fix. And, uh, and so by tuning them, I can try to uh, tune the system into close to a kind of non-ergodic or whatever phase or uh, of it. And therefore also probably see different types of intermediate uh, relaxations uh, or or never a relaxa relaxation into uh, an expected uh, thermal state etc et are you uh, can you say something about that so, so what do you have in mind say like a more insulator for example you, you are thinking like oh i can tune uh, the density to be one and then it's a more insulator and there is no transport and then uh, so, so strange things yeah, will happen for, for, for Bose Hubbard for, for Bose Hubbard model, right? right. For right. yeah, so then in principle, I can I can choose my uh density as or my my energy density, I can and my particle density also I can choose as as, as I want, right? So, right, right, and there are non there, there are so called non Gibbs uh, phases uh, in in the density parameter space uh, where you. Uh, run into troubles. So basically, if you fixed in, uh, the, if you fix the particle number density and you drive the energy density large enough, which you can always do, uh, you will run into uh, into these non-Gibbs phases where uh, no one knows how the Gibbs distribution would look like because there is none. Uh, for 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 a spin, uh, for, sorry, for a fermionic system, things will be much easier because you can. Because you have uh, an uh, an upper bound on the on the energy density, because you cannot uh, because there's an mm -hmm. upper bound the number of particles you can put on on one side. Right. Uh, then you can introduce the notion of negative temperatures at least. That's in, in right. The, right. At infinite temperature. That's right. Which uh, mm -hmm. yes, but if you have bosonic systems, uh, yeah, that doesn't work necessarily anymore. And that's so right. There yeah. are some issues. So so yeah. So I have to admit that. Um, that I haven't thought about that and and probably is outside this formalism because because remember, I mean ultimately this formalism is, is, is very clear what, what it's telling you. So you have your own perturb Hamiltonian and you know your energy densities and so on. And then uh, the own perturb dynamics has this relaxation time to the thermal equilibrium of the unperturbed guy. And then this, uh, what we are doing is finding the correction. So if that first thing is not satisfied, then, you know, I don't know, it's no man's land. <laughs> so I, I would not know what to do in that case. So, Thank you. Yeah. But, but it's, a, it's a good point. I mean, what, what, what would happen in those cases? That even if the unperturbed dynamics is, uh, uh, is troublesome, uh, yeah, thinking about corrections is uh, is yeah is is uh, is yeah complicated. Uh -huh. Sorry, related to this point, can you go to the probably the first or second slide, something like that? So the first or second slide. First slide. No, okay. So, uh, let's go to <laughs> the uh, let's go to the experimental plots. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. So. Yeah. Uh, Previous one. Okay. So uh, uh, now, okay. Um, we understand. Let's say, for example, u equal to one point five. We understand yeah. that there is the first decay, which is controlled by h naught. Then this plateau is an artifact. But no, 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 no. Actually, actually, no, no. So the the art. I mean, 
what, what I, I believe is an artifact this ah, no sorry 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 yeah, yeah, the last part, okay? sorry yeah yeah so, so, so the, the plateau it, the plateau here is just that it's not a plateau uh, yeah. it's not a plateau so it's a rate that okay. is very small you don't see it right Correct. before your numerics goes uh somehow sure, sure, problematic sure, sure. okay now the question is uh here uh, as you said it's important that you are in the weekly perturbation because you want to see the initial decay given by h naught let's say the, right. the initial per non per okay now when u is large like u equal to three this initial decay is controlled by what so by I mean, h naught yeah. or no, uh, by h by h so you see this is going to the expected thermal result which is zero that I shouldn't see. be a, a quasi-particle weight. So all of them so, should go to zero. It's just that uh, right. you sure, never sure. see it for these guys. But for three, you immediately see it. So this, in particular, this u equal to three is something that wouldn't be captured by your formalism because- That's right. That's right. I see. Okay, got it. I mean, for, for all I know, not even 2.5 or things. So, so they will be the early ones will be captured. Like, uh, so when u is sufficiently small, and, uh, okay. and then, then you have a crossover between the two things, right? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. There is, I mean, from the plot, there is no way to distinguish if, you know, the initial decay of u equal to three looks, let's say, qualitatively, I don't see a difference with, let's say, u equal to 1.5, to understand if I am in a regime in which the initial decay is controlled by the full h or h not, That's am I right? right? I mean, yeah. The other, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, one one would have to go and and then do the calculations and see how far you can you can describe it with the, okay. with the perturbation theory. Yeah, with the. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. But but I mean yeah, it is very very important that you point this out because this somehow you know went into people's mind and i think generated this idea that pre-thermalization was fast decay plateau fast decay and yeah and that that doesn't seem to be the case the, what seems to be mm -hmm. is the fast decay and then the exponential decay brings you back to to the thermal equilibrium mm -hmm. result or let's say this third uh in the thermodynamic limit is pushed to infinity right i mean is, is a finite size effect uh, or um, I mean, this numerical technique, I think, was because I, I think this was like dynamic and infinite theories, like done in some uh, infinite dimension. So maybe it's a thermodynamic limit, but then the time in which is valid is finite. I see. Like, I like, see, like I see. DMRG, right? DMRG, you can have mm -hmm. an infinite system, but then it, it is correct for some sure. time. Right? Uh, you sure, know, sure, one sure, dimension sure. diverges and. You, uh, yeah. After some time, you you're getting uh, nonsense. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've done. Okay. Do we have mm. any further questions from the audience? Seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank Marcos again. Uh, Thanks for having me. <laughs> And uh, with this, we conclude our today's uh, seminar. So. Um...